So welcome to Groundwork Webinar 2, Money Machines, Making Smart Decisions About Buying Foreign Machinery. I'm here with Shane LeBrake, who is our lead presenter, and Susie Hodgson, who um, has just recently joined the Groundwork staff. And uh, Susie, you can say hello quickly to everyone if you're still there um, with your mic open. Um, you can say hello on the chat. Um, we're going to get started. Um, I um, will try to help those of you who are having um, audio issues get them sorted out. And if you, if we don't, please know that we will be recording the session, and you will be able to watch the recording from the website. I'll also be sending out an email with the um, recording link information. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Shane, to get going. Great. Thanks, Beth, and welcome, everybody. Uh, I hope that this is an informative session today. For those of you who were in the last session two weeks ago, we obviously covered a lot of information in a little bit of time. So uh, hopefully today the pace is a little uh, more relaxed as we get into this more um, interesting topic in some ways. It's not as interesting as looking at lots of fun machinery, but um, we still have to think about how we're going to pay for it. So. Uh, with that, uh, we'll get through the first few slides here. Uh, all of our sponsors for the project. Sure. Yeah, I, um, yep. So um, this project is made possible through grant support from the Northeast Fair Program, um, with support from the University of Vermont Extension, and also from the Northeast Extension Risk Management Education Program. Here we are. Very good. So the subtitle of this topic is really it's the subject farmers don't talk about money. And um, what I have seen over my many years of working in agriculture is that uh, the, the story that we don't hear as people wanting to get into farming or learn about farming or wanting to have a farm of our own someday is how we pay for all this stuff. Um, what we what we do talk about, of course, are all the things that we like to complain about, but how the farm is actually paid for is the subject that eludes uh, many conversations. So here's a couple of thoughts to start the whole thing off. A good friend of mine from New York State where I was started out in farming, David Stern, some of you may know him from the Garlic Seed Foundation long ago said, and I believe he was quoting someone else, but it's a great way to live, but a hell of a way to make a living. And another friend of mine, John Spangler in West Virginia, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. That's something worth thinking about. And of course, his corollary is it's easier to spend than it is to make. So we're going to talk about spending money wisely today. Uh, making money, obviously, is a whole different topic. When I give most of my uh, lectures throughout the Northeast on any number of topics in agriculture, I come back to this quote all the time by William McDonough. William McDonough was a designer or is a designer and architect. He was at University of Virginia for many years and now he has his own design firm. He does work all over the world, uh, innovative, sustainable design. And he starts his thinking with this quote, this very simple quote, design is the first signal of human intention. And I think this applies to what we're talking about today. It applies to almost everything we deal with if you bring it down to its most basic concept. In other words, um, you're going to make a plan that's your design. And what's going to inform that design is knowing what you want, what your intention is. And as it says in the slide, a failure to design is a design to fail. So in some ways, what we're talking about when we talk about planning and investing and making money, um, is design, and good design really forces us to think about what is it that we truly want? What is it we're trying to achieve? What are our goals? You can choose your language, but basically we're trying to say the same thing. We're trying to narrow in on what it is that we really want to accomplish, what we really want to have, what we really want to do. And then when we have a plan, ideally it helps us fulfill those goals so that we achieve what we want. 
This is actually a picture from a tractor workshop I gave here in Akakeek, Maryland at the ecosystem farm that I ran for 12 years. This was after I ran it, but it shows the uh, variety of equipment we had at that farm as well as some of the tractors. There were a few other tractors there on loan, but um, these were all things we acquired over a few years' time to do the work of running our, our vegetable farm there. So I do a lot of consulting in the Northeast with uh, all kinds of clients involved in farming. And one of the things I always like to start with is an inventory of the entire site. If we're going to talk about creating a plan for uh, developing the farm, making equipment purchases, maybe infrastructure development, whatever it is, I like to first start with an inventory. This is going to inform my design process, my plan. And so I look. I like to uh, examine all of the assets that are on the farm. So we look at the infrastructure, what do they already have in the way of buildings, uh, water delivery, electricity, all of the stuff like that. We look at all of the equipment and we assess it. What's the condition of it? Is it appropriate? Is it not appropriate? Um, should some of it be sold? Do you not have enough, et cetera? We look at the land and the characteristics of the land and what that informs us in terms of how we might want to do things and what kind of equipment we need to do it. Um, we look at the financial resources, and this is a real critical point, and it's, it's a hard one to get people to talk about sometimes, but we need to understand if we're going to make a plan, what's really available to the whole picture of developing our, our plan, whether it's for machinery in particular or for other things on the farm. So we look at savings. Are there off-farm jobs contributing? Is there family money available? Are there uh, stocks that could be cashed in? Any number of things that we try to look at holistically. And then we also have to think about um, the inventory of individual skills and life experience. Um, some related to farming directly and some that's off farm that could relate to farming. So if you have uh, a former career or a set of skills that you got somewhere else that may be relevant or useful in running the business of the farm, we look at that. And then finally, we look at the people. Who's actually going to be part of the process of this, this work in farming? Uh, Joel Salatin, I'm sure many of you have heard of him. He's written many books. Actually, this morning when I opened my Washington Post, there was a big front page story on him in the food section. But Joel has said that every farmer has a hidden asset. And so I ask you, what is yours? Because that is part of the inventory. What do you have that could be helpful in this process of planning for your farm, including particularly purchasing machinery and equipment? We also need to assess what's wanted and what's needed. And of course, these aren't the same thing. Um, there's lots of things we all want, um, and I would guess that our list of what we want is probably a larger list than what we actually need. And of course, what we need is where we need to spend our money. Um, and if we're looking at anything specific to farm equipment, um, we need to assess it based on whether or not it's safe, is it reliable, is it appropriate. Uh, for what we're trying to do, is it sized for the work, for the acreage, for the type of work we're going to do on that ground? Um, that's all very important to figure out. What do we actually need as opposed to what we want? I'll, I'll be coming back to that throughout the, uh, the talk, actually, that simple point. And of course, unless any of us are independently wealthy, which I doubt some of us are anyway, um, there's always compromise. So we all know what we'd really like to have, what we might want, um, and then what we need. And those may not, you know, there may be a big gap between those things, between the tractor I'd really like to have and the tractor I can afford. Ideally, though, we get something that's optimal, that's going to give us the most return for the money that we have to spend on the on the object. And of course, when we're talking about machinery on farms, particularly in the case with people who don't have a lot of experience with equipment, with using equipment, my advice is don't compromise on safety. That is the one thing that should not be compromised on. We want to make sure that what we use is safe. So you create your plan, your timeline. You need to be realistic. But as this slide shows, uh, scrimping on safety could be a fatal uh, mistake. And of course, the next webinar two weeks from now is going to deal specifically with the topic of safety and training for safety on farms. Do we have any questions yet, Beth? I'm trying to follow the chat box as we go along here. I think we're good. 
Did you not hear that, Beth uh, Holtzman? Hmm. Sorry, folks. OK, so we're wanting to select equipment for our farms. And what I've done here is created a list of some criteria you might want to consider as you go through and think about what you need uh, on your operation. Some of you, I've looked at your assessments. Some of you are without any equipment. You're very early on in your planning for your operation. Um, a few of you in the, in the group, this groundwork group, have a fair amount of equipment, um, some that may not be appropriate, some that is. Um, anyway, so what we want to do first is uh, get the most bang for the buck. You know, we only have limited funds to spend. What's going to give us the biggest return? And it's not just in terms of comfort and convenience and luxury. It's got to be able to serve what we need in terms of our skill levels, what the scale of our operation is, what the scope of our operation is. You know, some things, some pieces of equipment that might be very appropriate on a livestock operation may not be that appropriate on a vegetable operation at all. And there are some things that actually readily transfer. Uh, both could use manure spreaders, for example, or uh, tillage equipment. Um, bale spikes if you're going to move round bales if you're mulching with them on a vegetable farm, things like that. Again, knowing what you need versus what you want. You know, I put that little picture up in the upper right hand side of the slide. Uh, it's certainly my fantasy for all the snow plowing work I do in the winter would, to have, would be to have one of those little Kubota RTVs. You know, the cab's got heat inside. It's much easier, much more comfortable, much safer too, honestly, than trying to plow snow with a tractor. But I don't need that, not at this point. And the cost of that is really quite expensive. So I'm willing to wait knowing that I actually have what I need to do the job, even though what maybe I want in my fantasy mind is, is something different. Um, when you're choosing equipment, when you're looking at equipment, even uh, used equipment, um, there's used and abused, as a dealer friend of mine said. And part of this whole process, in my mind, for those of you who are just getting into the whole arena of, of selecting equipment, is knowing what you're looking at. Part of the last webinar two weeks ago on uh, introduction to farm machinery and farm mechanization is really uh, designed to help you learn what's out there. There's a lot of different machinery out there, and there's there are deals to be had with used equipment. I'm not advocating that everybody go out and buy new equipment. But when you're looking at used equipment, you really need to know what you're looking at. And so hopefully through the, the, the early stages of this project anyway, um, you will be given some ideas, some ways of thinking about equipment that allow you to better make decisions when you're evaluating as to whether something is really worth the money that you're paying for it. Um, there are a number of people out there, I can, I can verify this, I've been out on the landscape, I've seen it over and over. You know, we think they know what they're doing, but the truth is they don't. And so there's a lot of machinery that gets abused. And, um, there are signs of that abuse. My friend likes to call them witness marks. Um, as you develop your skills and understanding machinery, equipment, engines, all of that, you'll be able to do some forensic work when you're looking at used equipment and decide whether or not it's really worth the money. And something else to bear in mind on that point, the seller, uh, whoever that is, the object that they're selling is always going to be worth more to them than it is to you. And that's your bargaining chip. You need to remember that that you can probably set a better price than what they're asking. And the more you know about machinery and what you're looking at, the more you can whittle down that asking price. Um, what are you going to use the machine for? What's your soil like if you're doing tillage work or even if you're doing other types of work on the ground? Um, if you have heavy soils that don't drain well, that's going to be something you might want to think about in terms of what kind of equipment you're going to choose. Uh, what's best for your skill level? There are, for example, with tractors, uh, the hydrostatic transmissions are easier to operate. You lose power uh, from the engine. You know, a 39, 40 horsepower tractor with a hydrostatic transmission is not going to deliver as much uh, actual power output to the power takeoff or to the front end loader that a similar gear shift tractor would. So um, even though it may be easier to operate, and that, that may be a, a real valid concern at the purchasing time, you might also want to think about what you're losing in uh, that convenience, because there are trade-offs. 
Um, are you prepared to operate that machine safely? Do you know how to maintain it, take care of it? Are you going to take the time to train yourself or get the training to do that? Uh, and as I was alluding to earlier in the use and abuse comment, while well, auctions are great, they're a lot of fun, you can find great deals, if you don't know what you're looking at, you could really end up with a lemon. So you have to be uh, mindful of that and hopefully learning more all the time about equipment so you make good, good decisions. Uh, more criteria. I, I highly uh, recommend that people research what they need very carefully. Figure out if it's appropriate for your operation. Uh, visit other farms. Find out who's got what it is you're looking for. Do they have one? Do they use it? Do they like it? Um, what are the pros and cons of each piece? Years ago at Akakik, at the ecosystem farm I managed for many years, we were very interested in getting a spading machine. That's a European tillage tool. Uh, there's two different types. We were looking at the Italian type. Um, and in fact, we ended up buying a five foot wide Chelly spader. And we looked at a lot of different farms where they were using spaders, both the Danish type, the Emonts, as well as the Italian types. I was actually able to borrow one. Uh, we're not far here where I am in Maryland from the USDA, um, one of the USDA uh, research sites up in Beltsville, Maryland, and they had the Danish made Emon spader. They were willing to let us borrow for a few weeks. So I actually was able to go up there, pick it up, bring it down to the farm. At that time, we didn't have a tractor large enough for that, so I had to borrow a, a larger tractor from somebody. But I was able to take that machine and actually use it at our farm for a few weeks and test it out and see what it was like to use it. And that's a very expensive piece of equipment. So having that opportunity to try it out on our farm and see what was involved in using it and maintaining it and um, using it in different conditions uh, in terms of trying to incorporate a cover crop or something like that, that was invaluable to our decision making process. So if there is a piece that you're interested in and you have the ability to try it out on somebody else's farm or you know, borrow one from somebody, use it on your own farm, see how it works in your soils. If you have real rocky soils, a spading machine might not be appropriate for that. It's going to wear down the, uh, the, 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 the ends of the blades very quickly, for example. You want to ask, is this going to really benefit what you do? Um, I know there's a lot of uh, people out there who can advocate very strongly for a piece of equipment and they're going to tell you, oh yeah, you need to get one of those. It's really going to help you. But the thing is, if you end up buying such a piece, and uh, for example, we'll stick with the spader, and I've seen this happen on a few farms in the Northeast, um, where you get that machine to your farm. It's a very expensive tool, uh, a spading machine, and you get it to your farm and you find out how difficult it is to get on and off the tractor, that it has to be operated in a creeper gear so it's very slow to use, that um, it's so challenging just to attach it that you are hesitant to take it on and off the tractor, that you end up either leaving it off all the time and you're not willing to go through the steps of, of using it and using it properly such that you've essentially tied up a lot of money in a tool that you're hardly ever using. And so I think that in this whole process of selecting, uh, of selecting equipment, thinking about buying equipment, before you even get to, to the money part, where is that money going to come from, you really need to think about, is this really worth it? That's the point I'm trying to make here. And if a machine scares you, and I've seen this too many, many times, where somebody gets a machine, whether it's a tractor or something to go with it, maybe even it's something as simple, relative to a tractor anyway, as a chainsaw that they're afraid to use, and they end up not using it. And of course, with our limited funds that we have available to us for the work that we do, in my mind anyway, every machine that we bring to our operation has to serve a purpose and it needs to help us make money, ideally. If we're in this for making money, if we're running a farm as a way of making a living, it has to help us make money. So here's a few thoughts about this whole thing. Um, you are a self-employed entrepreneur. We don't really talk about this much in farming, but you're running a business. You are, in fact, self-employed and you're an entrepreneur. You are the owner-operator. And you need to be mindful constantly of how you're making money. Are you actually making money? Do you know how long jobs are taking you? Are you making money on a particular job or a crop or an activity? 
um, or are you losing money? Do you actually track this? And of course, some of you, you can go to Richard Wiswall's book on um, the Organic Farmer's Business Handbook, and there's really good ideas in that book about looking at how you're actually tracking where your time and your money is going. But many of us are going to need working capital. And I know that as a class, a lot of farmers are really afraid of debt. But debt can be a positive thing if it helps us run our businesses more efficiently and more effectively. Remember, you're running a business. And to make money, you've got to spend some money. Otherwise, you could be very inefficient at what you're doing. Now, if I'm talking to homesteaders, my apologies if it's um, if some of this doesn't really apply, uh, it certainly is. You know, it's a very great thing, and it's wonderful. But if you're if you're talking about making a living, that's really what um, some of these points are are designed to address. So, in my mind, anyway, when we're thinking about machinery for our farms, um, they really need to serve us well. They need to serve the business side of it. So. Our new machinery, whether it be used or new, but new to us anyway, it should be doing all of these things for us. It needs to increase our efficiency with our operations. It needs to increase our productivity. Those are not necessarily the same thing, by the way. Um, it should enhance safety all the way around. Uh, if you're buying a tractor, for example, and it doesn't have a rollover protective structure and a working seat belt, that's not enhancing safety. It may be enhancing your efficiency and your productivity, but that's not a safe tractor, especially if you're a novice using these machineries, these types of machinery. And also, it should increase earnings, obviously. And theoretically, anyway, efficiency times or increase in efficiency times increase in productivity times increase in safety should all add up to an increase in earnings. And then it should reduce some things, ideally new equipment um, or at least use well-maintained equipment is going to reduce the amount of downtime you have from repairs and breakdowns of, of older equipment or lack of equipment. It should reduce stress, although I can realize too that sometimes new equipment actually increases stress because you, you're, you don't know how to use it yet. There's this kind of break-in period literally for the tool and for yourself trying to figure out how to use it. There's a certain um, risk and danger, obviously, and, and new equipment should help reduce that. And it should also help reduce these inherent, what I call the challenges and difficulties of farming. And we all know about that if we've been doing it. It's not an easy way to make a living. It's very difficult. And there's a lot of physical challenges, emotional challenges, financial challenges in farming that ideally, as we increase our arsenal of equipment and machinery, that should help reduce those, those challenges that we all face. Uh, another thing I think it's good to keep in the back of your mind when we're talking about equipment, especially when um, we hear from dealers or from other service providers in the profession, um, I've witnessed in my years in this work, over, which is well over 25, 30 years now, that there are there's a tendency to use a kind of a one-size-fits-all method in, in doling out advice. And um, I, I take issue with that. Um, I think there's, there's some constants in farming, as I call them. First and foremost, every year is different. It's not just that the weather is different on a farm every year. We all know that. And certainly, if uh, we accept the premise of climate change, we're seeing more and more differences every year. Um, we can just look out the window today on April 1st and see evidence of that no matter where you live here in the Northeast. I think we're all delayed in spring, uh, the onset of spring. But you know, there's other things that are different too from year to year um, that affect our cash flow, that are affect our finances, that are affect, affecting our, our very mental uh, capacity to go out and do the work. Maybe we've had a new child born into the household, or maybe the there's a divorce going on, or maybe there's a death in the family. We, we, we oftentimes don't take into account how some of those things are going to affect how every year is going to be different um, from the, the previous one. So we could have had a really great year last year. Everything was going wonderful. We were making money. And this year, it's just one thing after another. And unless you're kind of keeping track of these things on a daily basis, practically, it's hard to know how much some of these things really add up during the course of a year. Um, to that, I would recommend, you know, years ago when I got into farming, somebody said, you need to keep a daily journal. And uh, I've been doing that ever since. I've got over 20 years of journals that I've written in every single day. 
And I go back through those regularly, especially at the end of the year. I kind of do a mental check-in and just assess what was different. And it's surprising how much that can inform us. It helps us with our planning. Of course, every farm is different in terms of the land, soils, all of that. That's all obvious. We know that. But when we hear these generic kind of prescriptive um, methodologies about how we should be doing things, you really need to listen to that with a grain of salt and ask, what will, what's going to work for me and my farm, my soils, my livestock? You know, that's, that's knowing yourself. And that's really what I'm getting at. That's going to help inform our plan and our thinking. So at this point, I just want to check in, take a little break. Uh, are there questions yet from anybody on anything that's been said so far? Any comments, any questions from those of you who are hearing this right now? I'm monitoring the chat box. I'm not seeing anything. So either I'm putting you all to sleep. No, on I, a, think, a, I think we're good. I'm sorry I didn't respond <laughs> before. My mic was on mute. Um, I was able to get to it easier this time. So. Um, we're about um, halfway through our time, just to, just to give you a time check. Very good. Very good. Well, what I'd like to do now, um, the, the first part of this little slideshow today was designed to give you some ideas, some ways of thinking about your operation uh, holistically so that you can think about what you need and what you want maybe more accurately, more with more precision, so that as you start to make um, real decisions about buying, you have more information in your, your plan that better informs that decision making. And so here are some ways uh, to think about this based on um, the SMART method, which is a prescribed business concept, as well as some real life stories from some farmers who I really respect. Uh, disclaimer right off the top here, I am not an expert in SMART, but it's a well-known methodology. It's an acronym, S-M-A-R-T which stands for specific, measurable, and then depending on who you, uh, whose uh, book you're reading, the A stands for attainable. It might stand for action-oriented. Uh, the R stands for realistic or relevant. And then the T stands for time-bound. And uh, you'll find in the literature that uh, particularly the A and the R take on different meanings depending on who's uh, doing the, prescrip the prescribing. Uh, but anyway, there's a lot of information on this. There's books written about this. You can just do a quick look at um, what's online to learn more about the SMART method. Um, we'll start out, I was about to say specifically, the S stands for specific. And this goes back to what I was talking about earlier with McDonough in design. What is it you want to do? What's your intention? And these questions clearly help you hone in on the answer even better. Why do you want to do it? Who's going to be involved? Um, where is this going to be applied? Of course, for most of us, the answer is very simple for that. It's going to be on our farms. Um, looking at this whole question very specifically um, in, in terms of answering what it is you want to do and why, how are you going to get it done, honing in on uh, being precise in answering this. Measurable. Um, you know, we live in a world of quantifying everything to make it more um, measurable, for lack of a better way of putting it, and that's what this is all about. Can you quantify the decision-making process? Um, I think for a lot of us with equipment, there's a few ways to think about this. Uh, if you're buying a tillage tool, you might be thinking about how how is this going to help me improve my um, the speed of the work? Can I can I do can I get better results faster? Um, can I afford it? You know, there's there, there's a question of how much money should go into this. Um, do I have to budget for it? And if I do, how long will it take before I can afford it? These are all things you could actually plot out in your plan and measure. Attainable or action oriented. This is where you um, really look at how you're going to do it. Um, what steps you're going to take to make it successful. So, you know, I, I always used to say when I taught my apprentices, so we need to know our intention, we need to make a plan, and then we actually have to carry it out. So you can write out the steps um, with yourself or your farming partners, your family. What are you going to do to actually reach these goals? How can you make a plan that you can plot maybe on a calendar or other source of uh, record keeping that's going to help you find your way to reaching your goals. It should be uh, relevant. Um, 
Some people say realistic. Uh, both, I think, fit. Um, and, and again, you know, the, the better you understand and know what it is you want, you've thought it through, you've done your research, uh, this helps you answer this, this particular point more readily. Um, is it worthwhile for what you're doing? Uh, again, you know, I used the example earlier of choosing to buy a spading machine to do our tillage work at the ecosystem farm in Akakik. Um, you know, when I look back on that, that was a huge decision for us. We spent a lot of time looking at it. We visited a lot of farms that had these machines. Um, and it really seemed like the right decision at the time. But with experience and looking back on it, and I, I rarely found anybody who had anything negative to say about a spader, um, I'm not sure it was really the right choice. Um, and I would use a lot more caution going to look at one again, and I and I would actually caution people from buying them. So you know, really looking at, and I could go into a lot more reasons why, but time won't allow that today. But the point is, um, it might serve us well to pause as we're preparing to make a decision, and ask, is this really going to help? Is this really relevant to what we're trying to do, or might it not be? Um, maybe it's really not the right thing um, for what we're trying to do after all. It's a lot of money, so maybe we should wait. Um, another way maybe to think about this is a, a local contractor. I do contracting work as well in my community. I do a lot of custom work with my tractor and my equipment. And you know, I made a huge investment in that a few years ago, and there's other things I've certainly thought about purchasing. But a, another contractor who's now retired, he's a next door neighbor, great guy, very knowledgeable. He's advised me over and over again, just take it slow. Really think about what it is you're doing and why you're doing it and what you really need to get it done. And go slow. Don't, don't put a lot of money out there, tie up in uh, equipment that you may not be using. So I think that's good advice. I think that ties in. Is it realistic? Is it relevant? And then lastly, time bound. Um, Think about a schedule for this. You know, it, it, it slow yourself down a little bit again and say, you know, maybe we can't afford this now, um, but looking at where our sales were this past year and where they're going over the past three years, let's make a plan to start um, figuring out when we can afford to do this. And I think being mindful uh, of what you need and when you want to get it can be very helpful in thinking about the future of your operation and, and what you're going to be able to do. And it keeps you focused about um, how you're going to do that down the road, that you're, you're actually working toward a goal. So I'm no expert on SMART per se, but I think the work that I do myself mimics a lot of this. Um, it's just a, a very um, well-defined way of thinking about making decisions. And we wanted to incorporate it into this, because that's really what we're talking about with this whole discussion on buying um, machinery is assessing our needs and making good decisions. Right now, what I oh, uh, I should have I started to jump ahead here. Um, if you go online and you look up SMART, you're going to find a number of different ways. And I see Susie has uh, chimed in in the chat box with um, some different meanings for the letter A in SMART. Um, attainable, achievable, actionable, action-oriented. The little graph I put up on this slide comes from a, uh, a different site that's um, out of Canada. And you can see here where the A and the R are different from uh, some of the other um, ones that were shown a little earlier. Anyway, smart, making smart decisions. And that's what we really want to do. We want to make a smart decision. I put these two pictures up. Um, these are essentially um, similar tractors. Uh, oh, thank you. Somebody just chimed in. I think Susie, that she was using a UK reference in her language. Uh, these two tractors in the slides, um, the one on the left, an old Ford 8N with a front-end loader on it, um, basically is the uh, grandfather, maybe even the great-grandfather of the, of the one on the right. Um, New Holland was the outcome of uh, Ford being reincarnated in their tractor-making industry back about uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago now. And so you see on the right a very modern version of that tractor on the left. And while I know there are actually people in our groundwork audience who have a tractor very much like the one on the left, 
In fact, there's a couple out there who may have just recently acquired a tractor similar to that. Um, if you look at the one on the right, even though it's going to cost a lot more money unless you get one used, you're looking at some much more usable features um, on that tractor on the right. For one, it's got four-wheel drive. I'm going to challenge you in the audience to quickly figure out if you can tell how I know that just by looking at the pictures. Um, obviously, the one on the right also has a rollover protective structure, that roll bar. That's going to keep you safe. Um, the one on the right also has, I'm pretty sure I can see this in the picture, uh, quick release levers for the bucket so you can switch uh, quickly switch out the bucket and put on pallet forks, for example. Um, I know for a fact that the one on the right, the more modern tractor, is a much safer tractor. So if you, um, it's also a diesel engine tractor. It's going to be much more fuel efficient. It's going to give you more power output per unit of fuel used. And it's probably going to run a whole lot smoother. Those great uh, Ford 8Ns from the 50s are wonderful little tractors. Uh, they did have a low center of gravity, which made them safer to other tractors of the era. But um, they also have gasoline engines. And they're, they're old four-cylinder gasoline engines. Um, and they can be really finicky to keep running. So as you're assessing this stuff, these are things you might want to think about, which could be the smarter decision for your operation. OK, I'm going to give you some stories right now of farmers who I've known over the years um, who I think have made some really good contributions to this whole thought process on how we spend our money in farming. Uh, Chip Plank is now retired. He and his wife Susan operated Wheatland Vegetable Farms in uh, Virginia, about an hour to the west of um, Washington, D.C. That was their primary market uh, place over the years back in the 90s and the uh, 2000s. Uh, there was a point where they were selling at over 15 farmers markets every week in the DC metro region. They had a fleet, I think at one time it numbered almost eight, if not 10, Ford F-150s. And they, they liked those because they could do the maintenance all at once. It was the same all the way down the line. Um, I know I wouldn't be surprised if there aren't some people in the groundwork audience who worked at the Planks farm. I just taught in Philadelphia last weekend. And indeed, there was a woman in the audience who, when she heard I was from this area, said, do you know the Planks? And I was like, of course, they're old friends. So they they've, they've, uh, have a lot of progeny out there, people who have worked on their farm. Anyway, Chip, uh, I think he's got some very good advice to offer. This uh, comes from a keynote address at a PASA conference in 1995 for their beginning farmer workshop. And you can see as it's written there, um, first off, uh, this has changed a little bit. And he acknowledged this in a recent conversation. There was a time, certainly just 20 years ago, when banks wouldn't loan money to us who were just getting started. And so that wasn't an option. Today, you can actually get loans through FSA and uh, farm credit, but it was a lot harder if you were a beginning farmer or even just an aspiring farmer, not even actually on land yet, to borrow from banks 20 years ago. So his point was borrow from relatives, friends, savings, um, and that this isn't necessarily an unfortunate situation. And I like this second point that he made. At the beginning, act like you have money. And once you're established, act like you don't. There's some wisdom in that for you to, to tease out of there. He goes on to say, and I'll let you read this more carefully. Um, I'll just keep it simple, that uh, uh, we have this tendency as farmers to want to save and scrimp anywhere we can. And so his point was that you know we could spend a lot of time trying to salvage things like pallets, getting every nail, and trying to scrap wood, et cetera, et cetera, and do the same even with equipment, trying to keep something old running when really it may not be worth our time and our effort. And that they would, in their annual assessment, go back and look every year at what did they do that was new, or what did they get that was new that really helped them improve their bottom line. And they realized over and over again that there were a lot of those things they should have done much earlier in their farming career. It would have made life a lot easier. And they realized, too, that they actually probably could have not only afforded it, but if they had made the decision to make that purchase, it could have made them more productive and more profitable. Um, let's see. So Chip, Chip's got a lot of really good advice on that. You can probably find ways to uh, see him at conferences. He speaks throughout the Northeast at many conferences still. Uh, if any of you read Growing for Market, you may have heard of Alex and Betsy Hitt, who own Peregrine Farm in Graham, North Carolina. Uh, they have a wonderful story about how they finance their operation. I know this is particularly about machinery, but I think uh, the story, the, their story applies um, 
to machinery as well as to the way they finance their entire farm operation. Uh, they've been at it 34 years now, and when they started, they were right out of college. They both had degrees, I believe, in soil science from University of Utah or Utah State, whichever it was. And um, what they were able to do is uh, by setting up a sub-chapter S corporation, which is kind of like a, a, an LLC in a, in a different form but similar, um, they were able to raise $80,000 by getting 18 individuals to invest in their operation. And they had lined this up through an accountant and an attorney to make sure everything was legitimate, that everything would work properly. But uh, the average investment was $5,000. And the deal was everybody had to wait at least five years before they would get anything back. And the asset that they had was the land that they were buying. They were able to use that land as kind of the collateral on the, or the, the guarantee on the investment. So with that money, um, they were able to uh, use 20000 of it to make a down payment on the land. And this land had no house on it. Um, it was just land. And they also were able to buy a tractor, put in their irrigation system. They did a lot of perennials in the beginning. They had brambles and blueberries. So there was a lot of money tied up in getting plants established. They had to clear the land, no less. And they were able to start their house. It took them 5 to 13 years to pay off all the investors. And it was different back then. So we're talking uh, early 80s. This was during the early Reagan years. Uh, interest rates were a lot higher. Some of you who are young wouldn't remember this. But um, the tax laws were different too. And at the time, um, Alex was explaining to me this to me, and I'm not going to try and repeat all of it with any accuracy, but there were, um, uh, let's see if I have, it was a, a passive, you could write off passive losses against active investment. I guess that's the, 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 the quick summary of it. And um, so what happened in this situation is, is the people who invested in their farm paid essentially a dollar a share. And when it was repaid by Alex and Betsy, it was repaid at a rate of a dollar ten a share. But they were also able to write off 100% of that investment. So it allowed them to actually um, make money on that money in, in more than one way in terms of taxes. Um, so he considers this sort of a pre-CSA model and that people were basically buying shares in the farm to uh, help them get it going. And uh, they were investors. And as he recommends, get a good lawyer, get a good accountant. I'm looking down in the chat box. I think I missed something here. Um, Bjorn, I'm, I'm not sure if I pronounced it right. Asked something about a six volt charging system. Beth, were you trying to comment on that? No, I'm, 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 can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes. I'm just um, supporting Link. You're not hearing me? I am. Yeah, okay. I think that Sorry. Um, Jordan's um, a comment had to do with when you had the two tractors. It might have had to do with the, um, which one was the four-wheel drive. Um, I'm not, it came up around then. Um, and then I'm just augmenting with um, telling folks that there will be additional information about some of the topics you're talking about on the website. Yeah, actually, if I, if I understand what he's saying, if we're going back, uh, let me see if I can go back to that slide where I asked about two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive right there. He's probably correct that uh, the slide on the left of the Ford 8N probably did have a six-volt positive ground charging system. Uh, he gets points for that. Um, although some of those have been converted to 12-volt. Um, and I'll point out this right away. I have worked on a lot of these where they had 6-volt positive ground uh, charging systems with a generator, and people had put 12-volt batteries in not knowing that, or they put 6-volt batteries in and used the negative ground as you would with today's 12-volt batteries and did some damage to the starting system. So this is another one of those little things you learn to look for as you understand equipment. Um, but yes, that's one thing that, that he's correct on in making that point. All right, we'll go back to our little uh, quick stories here. The last um, story I want to tell, this is a, a recent story. Uh, Dominic Pascarelli and Kelsey Harrington are uh, young farmers. They are both in their late 20s. Um, they're in Scarborough, Maine, which is between uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and Portland, Maine. 
Uh, they're right on Route 1, which is the main uh, north-south highway that runs parallel to, to 95 up there. Um, Dominic and Kelsey both have master's degrees, I believe, in environmental studies from Clark University. And um, after they got their degrees, they spent a couple of years working on farms. They worked uh, for um, uh, um, the Arnolds in New York State, and they also worked um, in Vermont. I believe it was Maple Wind Farm in Vermont. Some of you up there would know that farm. And uh, they did a lot of research before they got started. Um, they're, they're among some of the most thoughtful young farmers I've come across. Um, they were very deliberate in the way that they went about setting up their farm, um, figuring out how they were going to finance everything. Um, basically, what they did is they had some money that they had saved, uh, very admirable at their age a few years ago. They would have been mid-20s. They had some family money. And they were also get to, able to tap into some money from this uh, slow money movement um, there in Maine. And there's actually a couple of sister groups to the main chapter of slow money, one called No Small Potatoes and another called Maine Organic Lenders. And between those uh, organizations, they were able to get some money to help them finance their operation. Um, specifically, uh, looking at my notes here, um, in their first year, uh, they were able to borrow about $30,000 through the Slow Main groups, and they had about $30,000 in their own money, so they had $60,000 to invest in their first year. In their second year, they, they actually borrowed another 10 through the, the Slow Money movement, as well as a small microloan through um, FSA to help them finance their operations. So they've now got about uh, to the tune of $90,000 invested in their startup. Um, they don't own the land. They lease it. Um, it's I can't remember the total acreage that they have on their lease. It's more than the amount in production. But last year, 2014, they had two and a half acres. And in their second year of production, their total gross was about $140,000. And that their net profit per acre was around uh, 45 to um, I'm sorry, it was a little bit a half of their gross. So in their first year, uh, second year, they're actually doing quite well. They're covering all their costs. And any uh, profit they make, they're reinvesting into the farm as quickly as they, they make it. Um, with that initial capital that they had two years ago, they were able to find a used 34 horsepower Kubota with front end loader and a four wheel drive. They got an excellent price on it from the original owner in Massachusetts. It was in great condition. It was a 19, late 1990s model, so it had about uh, 15 years use on it. They were able to buy it for less than $10,000. I think the owner wanted 10, and uh, they were able to get it for around eight. They were also, also able to purchase a used disc harrow. They got a great deal on a Gandhi drop spreader for spreading fertilizers, a flail mower. And then they had enough cash, and they knew that they wanted to do this, that they were able to buy their rototiller new, and they also got pallet forks for that quick attach front end loader. Last year, they were able to purchase a snow blower. It's critical to their operation. They have a bunch of high tunnels, and as snow comes off the high tunnels, they're able to blow it away. Uh, and this year, they've already budgeted based on the growth over each of the last two years to purchase a larger tractor so that they can pull a manure spreader. Um, in fact, they've actually bought the manure spreader. I was talking with Dominic just a couple days ago. It hasn't arrived yet, but they were able to get a brand new one. Um, and they plan to get a chisel plow and bed lifter this year as well. So um, I'm really impressed. They've done their homework. They've done a great job of getting a small operation set up quickly, and they've been very successful. Now, they acknowledge that um, they are uh, in some really great markets. They, they're, they're between Portsmouth, Portsmouth and uh, Portland. So they're in the Portland market. They're in the uh, Kennebunk Port market. They're in markets in the wintertime in New Hampshire, um, Exeter, and I think Portsmouth. So they've got some great markets. They're going year round. They have high tunnel production throughout the winter. Um, and they've done extremely well. I see somebody chimed in um, that much equipment for two and a half acres. Well, yeah, it's primarily the two of them. They do have part-time workers. Um, and this is an interesting point, Russ, that you raise. Um, I don't know if you're challenging that or if you're just curious. Um, 
And I'll, I'll answer Kirk's question too. Is a bed lifter the same as a bed maker? No. A bed lifter, some people call it an undercutter. Uh, it goes under crops like carrots. If you have a bed of carrots, say three rows to the bed, um, or beets or uh, other root crops, um, a bed lifter is like a giant shaped U with a blade and the bottom of the U. And it goes on your three-point hitch, and it's drawn behind the tractor. And it, what it does is it sort of lifts the bed up to make harvesting things like carrots and beets and that a lot faster. And I see, Russ, that you say that you're not challenging, just trying to learn. No, that's great. It's a great point. And you know, I was thinking about that very point, Russ, as I was uh, putting this all together. Um, certainly, if, I'm going to guess. Let me just do a quick poll. How many of you, as part of your uh, early um, learning in uh, if it's particularly if we're dealing with organic vegetable production, read Elliot Coleman's book, The New Organic Grower. I'm going to guess that there's a number of you who probably did. Um, yep, a few yeses are coming in. Uh, there's, you know, obviously there's not a lot out there for us to read if we're trying to read about this. There's Vern Grubinger's book, uh, Sustainable Vegetable Production from Startup to Market. There's Elliot Coleman's books. Um, but there's really not a lot out there. And so when you're trying to figure out what kind of equipment to get for a small scale operation, I can see where you would readily think that maybe that's a lot of machinery. And by the way, I forgot to mention that in year two, they also bought a, um, a plastic layer, and, uh, which is a bed shaper. Um, and it seems like I'm leaving out one other thing that they were able to buy last year. Um, no, they've really gone at it putting their resources into machinery. And they feel that it really improves their efficiency and their bottom line. And what he was telling me, and I think this goes in sync with everything that we've talked about up until this point today, that um, you know, when they sat down at the very beginning, and they, they also got help from uh, a lot of um, outside help, one of the things they did is to get a SCORE mentor. Um, I don't know if you can type in, Beth, uh, if, if uh, people know about SCORE, S-C-O-R-E, which is a resource. Uh, usually it's retired individuals who will mentor people in business. So they had a SCORE mentor that helped them think through all the financing of this. Uh, they also mentioned that they're both very risk averse. Um, but they had very clear goals in terms of both sales and what they wanted to do with the money that they earned from their operation. And what they realized is that um, in year one, that they had, when they assessed the year at the end of the year, that they had made a lot of mistakes, that they realized that they could do better, and that they, they had um, broken their records or their that's not the right way I want to say this, that they beat their goals for earning income on the farm in their first year. So their thought was, well, we already beat our income goals for year one, and that was, that was with making a lot of mistakes. So when they sat down for year two, they said, well, let, what, what can we do better in year two? And again, in year two, they did much better than they did in year one, and they felt that they still made mistakes, but they could see that they were on the right track. And so now what they're doing in their assessment, in their planning, is they're saying, what do we need to continue this growth and success and to reach a scale where we can meet our lifestyle goals? Think about that for a minute. They're, they're at this stage and they're saying, what can we do that helps us better meet our lifestyle goals? And what they want to be able to do is reach a sales level that allows them to comfortably employ somebody full time year round so that they're able to take some time off at different times of the year to do the things that they want to do outside of farming. Um, so I've just been really impressed with the holistic uh, thinking that they bring to their entire operation and the way that they think about mechanizing as a way of improving productivity, efficiency, sales, and safety. You know, they're buying good machinery. When they can afford it, they buy new. If they're buying used, they're getting really good advice. I have to raise my hand and say I've actually provided a lot of counseling to them on their equipment selection, um, which is going to be available to all of the people who are taking this uh, groundwork uh, course, right, Beth? That's part of the program. Is that, um, yes, that, that is true. Uh, uh, yep. So uh, anyway, I think it's a really good story. Um, I know we're almost at the end here. 
Um, so I have some parting thoughts, and then I'm going to just give a quick summary. So I love these quotes. Um, I use quotes to simplify thinking. Uh, good judgment is the result of experience, and experience is the result of bad judgment. That's just a good way of saying we're all going to make mistakes. And as long as we're learning from those mistakes, even with equipment purchases, we're going in the right direction. That reminds me of another one. You know, Will Rogers said, even if you're on the right track, you'll still get run over if you just sit there. And then also from the Farmer's Almanac, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. Well, that's the whole point of this. We're trying to help you make better decisions that are, that are going to be more penny wise in the long run. And ignorance is expensive. Making poor decisions, making bad decisions based on bad judgment, is a, it's going to cost you money. Um, that said, you know, we all have limited resources. So knowing that you can do the absolute best with what you have, where you are right now, that's got to that's got to stay with you. Don't lose sight of that. And then, lastly, from Franklin Roosevelt, I, I think this is just a great quote: "You cannot borrow your way out of debt, but you can invest your way into a sounder future." You know, we tend to be. I think a lot of farmers are very debt averse. Um, you know, last night, uh, well, a couple of days ago when I was talking to Dominic, actually, we were talking about this, how he and, and Kelsey, and, and I can relate this about myself, we're all very risk averse, um, which is partly why I focus so much on safety, but I'm not debt averse. My whole point earlier on was to talk about money. We're running a business, and a small amount of manageable debt invested wisely in equipment and machinery can really help us out incredibly. I have met a number of farmers who are so afraid of debt, they don't want any debt, and yet a little bit of debt could take them a long way towards reaching their goals. Uh, a farmer I worked with here in Maryland needed a deer fence. They were losing unknown amounts of, of crop value to deer damage, really needed a deer fence, and I said, you know, the return on that investment is going to be immediate. Um, you're also losing sleep at night because you're afraid of deer eating your crops. You're literally not sleeping because you're afraid of these deer going out and eating your crops. Well, we need our sleep as farmers, obviously. Um, I just found that to be a really unfounded fear of debt, that that money spent on that fence could be so uh, readily earned back in terms of increased earnings, in terms of um, product not lost to, to deer damage in terms of increased rest and peace of mind, that that would be a really good use of debt dollars. So thinking about debt in a way that allows us to go forward to make um, purchase decisions that will actually help us on our farms. So here's the, the end shot. Um, as you're thinking about this, ask yourself, what do you have already? What is it you want? How does that differ from what you actually need? What can you afford? How can you get it and when so that it works for you? And recognize that compromise is always going to be a part of the picture. Unless we're independently wealthy, most of us are going to have to compromise. But the thing that we should not compromise on ever is safety. This is dangerous work that we do. We're out there with loggers and fishermen and uh, I think uh, miners in the uh, injury and fatality um, uh, statistics, so it's really important to realize that safety is not something we should be scrimping on. And so for a couple of uh, resource links, um, last year I gave a webinar on buying new and used machinery. I think there's a lot of good information on there specific to assessment of uh, machinery, what, what to look for. And then last, um, there's a great resource on the web that uh, has a number of links to funding resources for new and beginning farmers. That's the link right there. And uh, that's essentially the um, right on time. That's today's presentation. Any questions from anybody in the audience? Thank you, Shane. Wow. Um, I have a question. <laughs> um, this is that. Sure. And I oh, OK. I'll we'll take Nathan's first. He said, how can you tell which tractor is four-wheel drive? Um, back in your picture. Oh, um, um, okay. Let me go back to that picture, and I'll I'll point it out real quick. Okay. So, who was asking this question? This is Nathan. I'm sorry, Nathan. Uh, Nathan oh yeah, I see it that, now. That was yeah. an up. Uh, yeah. yeah, I see it, Nathan. Uh, that didn't show up a moment ago when you asked the question. Okay, so how can I tell it's four-wheel drive? Well, if you look at the tractor on the right, the picture of the tractor on the right, you'll notice that the front tires 
are the same as the rear tire, and and those are um, ag tires. Those are the uh, the um, treaded ag tires, and that right away is a sign that you have front, uh, four wheel drive or what we call mechanical front wheel drive on a tractor. If you look at the tractor on the left, the old Ford 8N, the front tires on that tractor are what they call rib tires. They're not the same tread as, as the rear. And that right away is a dead giveaway that you have four wheel drive uh, on the more modern tractor on the uh, right. Additionally, something to know about this is that today it's practically um, you are not going to see a tractor with a front end loader that's made for market today without four wheel drive. Um, you can order them, but any that are on lots in uh, new dealer lots, they're all going to be four wheel drive. And that's primarily because four wheel drive gives you so much more um, output when you're working in large um, piles with a loader. Okay, I see some other questions. I hope that answered your question, Nathan. So what you really want to do is, is look at those front tires. That's a dead giveaway. Now, I should point out, Nathan, you can have a four-wheel drive tractor with turf tires, um, meaning the type of tires that are used for mowing applications, like on golf courses or some. I know farmers who use turf tires on their pastures because they're less destructive to the, uh, to the, to the grass that they're trying to grow. And you can get a four-wheel drive tractor with turf tires, um, and you would be able to tell that by looking at the uh, underneath the front wheel or the front axle. There's going to be a differential, just like there is in the rear, if you know what you're looking at. So I see there's a question too uh, from Mike. What are my thoughts and comments regarding a John Deere 5055E tractor as the main tractor for a 10 to 12 acre vegetable farm? Um, that's, uh, if I'm correct, Mike, I'm having to remember that tractor. Um, I think I looked it up because I looked at your, um, your self-assessment, and I think I remember seeing that one. That's a fairly large tractor, I think, right? Um, can you type in the horsepower on that, Mike, in the chat box, if you're still there? Yeah, 55? Yep. Um, I think that's... Totally appropriate, Mike. Um, you've got 10 to 12 acres. Um, I don't see anything wrong with that. Uh, you're right. With a 55 horsepower tractor, Mike, you're right on the edge of category one and category two implements. And that's a whole other issue we didn't really bring up in this discussion today. Um, and that is discussed in that other webinar that there's a link to at the end of this discussion. But um, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, um, the three-point hitch, which is the lifting apparatus on the rear of the tractor for lifting and lowering implements, uh, that is, they're divided into um, categories. Category one, two, and three typically is what we see on ag tractors. There actually is a category zero, which really qualifies for the really tiny garden tractors. But um, what those categories refer to is the lift capacity of the three-point hitch. And approximately up to 50, 55 horsepower, it depends on the vintage of the tractor, you're dealing with category one implements. Those are at the small end of the scale, generally speaking. Um, when you get over 55 horsepower, around 60 horsepower, on up to about 100 horsepower, you start dealing with category two implements. And that has huge implications in terms of cost, as well as ease of mounting those implements to the tractor. Um, certainly with 10 to 12 acres in cultivation, depending on how you've got that broken up, what kind of uh, operations you're doing, that's not an undersized tractor at all, and it's not oversized. I think it's actually very appropriate for that, that acreage. I hope that makes you feel good about the decision. That's fairly new, isn't it, Mike? I'm pretty sure that's a, um, not a very old tractor. Uh, Justin, you raise a really good question. Are grants still available for retrofitting tractors with ROPS? Um, the answer, it's, it's a yes and a no answer, uh, Justin. Um, the tractor in the picture that's still up on the uh, webinar slideshow, the Ford Model 8N, you would not be able to get a ROPS for that tractor. For those of you who don't know, ROPS stands for Rollover Protective Structure. Um, that will be covered a lot in the next webinar, but um, the ROPS started coming into use in the 1960s. It really wasn't until around uh, the late 70s, early 80s that they became standard on all tractors. There are grants available. Uh, you can um, 
I know that NICAM, N-Y-C-A-M-H, I don't know if Beth, you could type that into the chat box. Uh, it'll be in the next Already webinar there. as well. Uh, the New York Center for Ag Medicine and Health um, has made grants available to farmers to help them cover the cost of retrofitting their tractor with ROPS. The thing to understand, though, with ROPS, um, no manufacturer will recommend, nor will they um, secure, um, what am I trying to say? If you have an accident on a tractor that had a ROPS put on by a welder that was custom made and not put on by the manufacturer, you're not going to be um, covered if there's an accident and you're injured. In other words, the ROPS has to be specific to the make and model of the tractor by the maker of the tractor. So um, if you had a, you know, a 1980 Ford 1710 without a ROPS, you could go to a Ford New Holland dealer and they have a ROPS that is specifically designed for that tractor that they can install. Um, there is no ROPS that was made for that Ford 8N and you can't retrofit one. The other thing you need to realize too is that a ROPS only works when the uh, seat has a seat belt and you're actually using it. So none of these old tractors like the Ford 8N in the picture on the left even had a seat belt, nor would it be appropriate. In fact, in that case, you want to be able to fall out of the seat of the tractor if there's a rollover because there's nothing protecting you. Um, I hope that addresses the question. I will say too, Justin, on that note, um, a friend of mine just bought a 1977 Kubota B7100. It's just down the street from me. He wants to use it for mowing his uh, fairly flat meadow that he has. He's got about a four acre meadow. That's a very small horsepower tractor. Um, it did not have a ROPS uh, when it was made but he, he can get one installed and Kubota actually offers a cost share. So if he goes to the Kubota dealer down the road from us, 30 miles down the road, uh, Kubota will actually offset $600 of the cost of installing that ROPS. So whether it's a grant or a dealer provided incentive, yes, uh, assuming the tractor can actually be fitted with a ROPS and that's going to be determined by the age of the tractor. So basically stuff starting in the mid 60s forward, most of those can be. Anything prior to the mid 60s won't be. I hope that answers your question. Uh, any others before we sign off for the day? So I'll give um, you a moment. Everybody, you can, if, you, if, if people have questions, you can send them to um, us at um, groundwk at uvm.edu and I will get them to um, to Shane um, or find and help you find resources or the answers to your questions. So um, uh, we'll, we'll be continuing to do that. And the other thing I wanted to just um, remind people is that um, as part of the grant funding, um, particularly from the risk management education program, we have um, funding to do some individual technical assistance and coaching on mechanization decision making for you um, um, by email, phone, and in some cases in person. Um, so um, after the third webinar, I'll be sharing more information about how you can take um, advantage of that. But I wanted you to keep it in mind if you have specific questions about what might work in your operation, what would be um, the the thing that you can do that will advance your operation um, towards your goals. Um, that's what we want to be um, helping you with later um, in the project. So um, we're, it's, it's time for us all to move on with our days. I want to thank you all for being with us and um, sticking out the little bit of technical glitches we had in the beginning. And if you have any questions, please get in touch with me or Susie or Shane. Um, we'll be happy to help you. So thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.